Welcome to the Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is Mr. Carm Chickalese, who is the president and founder of CyberChick, which provides cyber information and cognitive security strategies and courseware. He is also a retired U.S. Army officer who spent 29 years in uniform. His last assignment was as the Army Chief of Cyberspace and Information Operations. Carm Chickalese, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited about this. How about we start off with a little more about your background? We mentioned just a moment ago your end of career jobs. Can you discuss more about what qualified you to lead the cyberspace and information operations portfolio? Sure. So uh, I graduated from the United States Military Academy in 1987. Um, you know, while I was there, I had started off with an interest in computers and uh, took a, a mandatory course in Fortran. Uh, that didn't quite catch my eye at the time. Uh, others, family members and friends would say, well, maybe if it had taken basic or COBOL, you might have enjoyed it more. But uh, as it was, I, nonetheless, I commissioned into the Army Signal Corps. And, uh, you know, there I had to understand and apply radio wave propagation, multiplexing and encryption uh, type of technologies. Uh, but in the first part of my career, I think what was most important was that I, I worked for the artillery and aviation units. So artillery, aviation, infantry, armor, those are the army combat arms, they're the operators. And I learned to do business their way. I learned their vernacular. In fact, I even commanded an aviation company headquarters and deployed it to Haiti. Um, but that ability to speak their language uh, would serve me well later in my career because I, I developed the ability to give the boss the operational so what to cyber and information operations and, and stay out of the technical weeds uh, as much as possible. But also along the way, I had a, a, an aviation commander who had spent some time with the Defense Information Systems Agency, and he was very interested in using the fledgling internet in the early mid 90s. Uh, so that of course uh, reinvigorated my interest in computers. And if the boss is interested, then I'm of course interested. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, so we were, we had two accounts in the brigade. He had one and I had the other. And most of what I did was to troubleshoot it so that uh, he could do what he needed to do. So mine was kind of like the, the, the test bed account and to make sure that his uh, worked. Uh, and then I went to Fort Meade and there I was responsible uh, for installing, operating and maintaining a Novell 4.1 server. And uh, this was a great learning experience for me at Fort Meade. I started taking some more classes in Unix uh, we also did a Windows uh, new technology or NT migration. So at the time, you know, this was a battalion that had its own connection to the internet. And then the higher headquarters were standing up and said, no, we need to start pulling these all together. I mean, this was truly uh, the WWW, the wild, wild west of the dot mill at the time, because everybody was doing their own thing uh, with regards to internet access. But I was at at the same time, I also went to uh, school and was earning a master's of science in telecommunications management. I was pulling apart systems and computers and benchmarking them. And I really became you know, very familiar with the way a system and network operated. I could pull it apart, I could maintain it, I, I could do the sysadmin. And then the other part to this organization um, was I got to see what they did. And it was very interesting. So this was an organization, they did the Army's polygraphs or lie detection. They also had the Tempest office. So you, if you've ever seen a military equipment, it's labeled, this is Tempest certified. And what Tempest is about is keeping those extraneous electromagnetic waves contained so that they don't go astray. You know, for example, I spent some time in the Tempest lab and if you point a directional antenna at the back of a computer screen, you can read what the computer screen is actually saying. Um, and you know that's a vulnerability sometimes people don't think about. Uh, they also had technical surveillance countermeasures or what you might call bug sweeping. 
And they also had the Army's first cyber forensic unit or uh, information warfare branch. So I would spend some time over there and I would learn what they did. And this was all you know, very interesting to me. And then I went over to the National Security Agency and worked in information assurance. Uh, I saw the other side of what NSA does with regards to signals intelligence and what was at the time called the Information Operations Technology Center. So now that I understood how information moved and how to affect it, that, that kind of drew me into the, this concept of information operations that was emerging in the late 90s. So by 2000, I became the first information operations officer at First CAV. But the Army's uh, perception of IO was different. Uh, they focused more, whereas I was familiar with how information flowed and how to affect the information flow, this was more about information content. So their big experience with IO was about winning the hearts and minds of Bosnia. And it was more oriented on that soft science of messaging and influence uh, that now I think has kind of become more commonplace with information operations. And my division commander, though, used to tell his brigade commanders at the end of any update, he always told them two things. One, you know, conduct vigorous counter uh, reconnaissance and maintain constant pressure on the enemy. And at that one, 19 constant pressure in the enemy, I kind of adopted that mantra for IO. Mm -hmm. I then went to Special Operations Command and their attitude was use anything possible, including information, to defeat you know, an individual or a small unit cell to support their counterterrorism mission. And so you know, they were open to any of the realm of the possibilities. And when I went back to First Cav, division and then had to deploy to Baghdad for 14 months. You know, we had insurgents, we had terrorists, we had militias. My attitude was we're going to throw the information kitchen sink at them. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, we're going to use everything possible to message the Iraqis to support the coalition security forces. And we were just, you know, maintain constant pressure with information on all of these audiences to, to keep them informed or, or influenced uh, to, to do, you know, to support the operations. And in the case of Iraqis, it's, you know, very much a forthright effort uh, so that they accept the coalition security forces. Uh, but on your adversaries, it's a, I'll just say it's a little more ruthless in using information uh, to get them to not uh, interfere with operations. And, uh, and from there, I went to the Joint Forces Staff College where I was faculty and director of uh, both, what I call both halves of my career, the Joint Command and Control, the Signal Side and Information Operations School, the second half of my career. And while I was there, we started the first cyber elective for the college and also worked with STRATCOM in developing a cyberspace planners course. And from there, uh, I thought I was going to retire. And then uh, uh, our friend, uh, John Davis, uh, conned me out of retirement and uh, went to the Pentagon. And his take there was, you know, they needed somebody who understood uh, cyberspace and information operations uh, because what had been the operations directorate or operations division for information was now the operations division for cyberspace and information. Wow, okay, that's a great recap. Thanks, Carm. And also a funny little story there about John Davis. And of course, uh, General Davis was also a a guest on the podcast. So w w when did you retire from the army? So I retired in 2016 uh -huh. and that was after 29 years of service. Yeah. And so in that last uh, gig uh, at the Pentagon, you know, so I had the four years of duty uh, managing the cyberspace and information operations portfolio. You know, cyber was really taking off because Cyber was once called, cyberspace operations was once called computer network operations, which was one of the information operations uh, pillars. Um, but, you know, I remember this in uh, on October 30th of 2012, uh, the resource management directive came down from the Office of Secretary of Defense, uh, mandating the creation of the cyber mission force. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was early in my tenure there. And then nearly for the next, you know, three and a half to four years, 90% of what I did was about building out the Army's cyberspace 
capability in terms of its portion of the cyber mission force. And then also um, what would become the Army's own tactical capabilities from you know, creating a military occupational specialty to redesignating the signal center of excellence as the cyber center of excellence uh, to working a lot of command and control relationships, you know, um, and, and creating all those strategic level policies to organize, train and equip uh, the cyber operations force. So, you know, part of what we had to do, like I mentioned, was establishing those new C2 relationships, command and control relationships, and, you know, developing all of those, you know, doctrine, organization, training, et cetera, requirements. And, and some of them were very challenging uh, because, you know, honestly, we, we were breaking, you know, the proverbial rice poles where organizations were accustomed to being the lead agent and were being asked to shift responsibility to different organizations. But army leaders like responsibility and won't readily, readily shed it when it is germane to what they do. So when you look at, you know, part of it was coming out of the Signal Corps, part of cyber was coming out of uh, the intelligence, and also you needed others who just had that uh, kind of operational mindset. Um, so it, it, can be, it can be challenging. Um, like I said, people don't want to give up responsibility. That's what, what makes them great leaders. They, they gravitate towards responsibility. So, you know, for example, the, one of my last policy missions was to find a way to integrate the commander's cyber readiness inspection, the inspector general cyber inspection, the force protection, and a couple of other cyber related inspections for classified systems and for threat insider threats into a coordinated effort. So those inspected units weren't overwhelmed with this wave of inspections. I can't get better if you just keep inspecting everything I do, uh, which, was, which was hard. Because every time you know you put forth a recommendation, another office that had an equity at the stake would say, "Well, that's against policy," and you know we'd respond with, "Yeah, but that, that's why we're here to recommend policy changes." So you know, just as I intimated, it can be hard to change the way a large organization does business. Right, right. So you you've done b both theoretically and practically. It sounds like a, a considerable amount of of uh, thinking about risk and security. Could you give our audience a general overview of risk and risk management, both in say a national security context and in a corporate context? Sure, um, first let me stay, set the stage a bit though with what CyberChick does. Uh, you know, when I organized and named the business, I went with CyberChick or CIC where that CIC is a play on my last name, of course, and an acronym for Cyber Information and Cognitive Security Strategies and Courseware. And for the first four years, uh, your business worked in the Department of Defense, cyberspace and information operations realm, uh, more so than cyber and information security. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work with the Department of Defense persistent cyber training environment, and then also with the Indiana National Guard's uh, Cybertropolis at Muscatatuck Cyber Training Center. And we've also you know, done some work on uh, information warfare, war game, and a tabletop exercise for the Army's information advantage formation experiment. It's been a lot of fun um, with that. But then uh, I've also done some teaching. And as an individual and also as a business, we, we taught introduction to cyber warfare and cyber for program teams to NAVAIR. Um, the business hasn't done much work for cognitive security, although you can say that the information warfare war game was working on that. And to some degree, information advantage is about, you know, achieving uh, cognitive security. Um, but because we haven't done some of the work, I've started to kick around the cognitive security concept on my business blog, and then also adjusting time, kind of to the reality of what you're really doing, because what you might set off to do and they're like, well, after four years, that's not really what I'm doing. So what, what are we doing now? Our, our five lines of business as we see them is uh, one, continuing support to DOD clients for cyber and information operations. Two, networking and business intelligence for vendors and consultants to Department of Defense. Three, connecting businesses to non-bank capital. Four, assisting technical startups with uh, business strategies. And the last one, and kind of to where this discussion is going is the emerging business to support non-federal government commercial businesses with information security risk assessments. Now, I, I will add that 
my pro bono work is really to uh, mentor other veterans uh, on establishing their own uh, small businesses uh, so they don't make some of the mistakes that I made. And that, that's about you know, trying to give back uh, to others what you've learned. Um, but I think most of our discussion will focus on applying you know, what I learned in the military on that last line of business of conducting risk assessments to the non-federal government and, and especially the commercial sector. So, you know, I, I mentioned I teach a course in cyber resilience to program managers and I tell them, mm -hmm. you know, cyber risk is risk. And, and frankly, risk is risk. It, it doesn't matter what you quantify or you put in front of it. It's a comparison of the likelihood of an event happening measured against the impact or consequence of the event happening. So, you know, for example, if one is designing an airworthy cyber resilient platform, and the threat air defense can turn off a specific capability on that platform if it is within one kilometer of the airplane for more than two minutes. What is the impact of that threat? Well, that kind of depends. You know, one kilometer, uh, you know, access for two minutes. Well, who might that apply to? Well, if it's a helicopter, well, that that's a possibility. If it's uh, an A-10 warthog you know, that's doing a lot of uh, you know, tight turns in close combat, uh, in, in close air support, that, that's a possibility. If it's a fast mover, is that really likely? Is, mm. is there a threat? So you have to, it, you know, you just can't apply a blanket template. You have to evaluate each one you know, based on you know, the system. And you know, that's again, that that's what risk is and so that's what you're trying to measure the likelihood of something happening against the impact or consequence of the event happening yeah carm that's a fantastic example there that you gave about the aircraft and so maybe one of the bottom line considerations is that uh, context really matters would you say that's fair oh I, I absolutely uh, you you have to understand you know your situation um, don't, don't get caught up in ever saying, you know, well, what's the best practice? What's everybody else doing? Uh, you have to understand why everybody else is doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are some of the things that you think corporate or military leaders are missing? And are there any blind spots relative to risk, which are new or peculiar to this moment? Yeah, I, I'm spending most of my time thinking about commercial side risk. I, I think the military and federal government have plenty of risk models and security people to give risk lots of attention. I've attended so many forums with you know, current and former federal government officials discussing cyber issues that it, you know, I think we've got a good handle on it. Um, and also from speaking with colleagues who have been state you know, chief information uh, officers, uh, state and local governments have a real challenge in this space. And county governments are really in an awkward position as they often cover the hinterlands where resources are more scarce than states and city. But, but nonetheless, government looks at risk differently. It, it isn't considering the bottom line of revenue and profit the same way. It, you know, it looks to say, okay, I've got some risk. Now, if I go define the requirement, you, you'll give me money and, and I, I, can, I can fix it or not. But there's not this discussion of how is it, you know, the government will always be in business or will, will always operate, I should say, um, doesn't necessarily operate well uh, if it has uh, cyber intrusions right, or, or information breaches, but businesses will collapse and, and organizations will go out of business if they don't uh, fix this. So, you know, in a corporate or commercial organization, I want to have this discussion with the, the CEO or the president or the board rich at large and say, you know, how comfortable are you in assisting, assessing the risk that an information breach will do material harm to your organization? And, and I'll talk about more about that question where it came from in a bit. But, you know, on the commercial side, businesses pay attention to information related risk and in varying degrees, depending on the, the business size and the vertical. You know, for example, the, the banking and financial sector is probably at the forefront, maybe followed by health and energy, with you know, two of the three having some sort of federal guidelines to meet. And mm -hmm. energy may be the most advanced of the critical infrastructure, but hardly advanced 
and the rest, like water treatment plants, are very vulnerable. And, and as we just saw, you know, in the past week, you know, with the Colonial Pipeline uh, disruption, now the the threat was to the business side, uh, but out of uh, the proper abundance of caution, uh, you know, Colonial uh, Pipeline had to take some measures uh, on the operational technology side uh, to, to minimize. Uh, you know, again, the, the risk of something out, over there happening. But not so it's not to say that the, the energy sector is, is all that great as well. It's just getting a lot of attention. Um, so, you know, I'm looking to move into the non-federal government commercial sector and, and, I, and to think about how to apply what I learned in the military application of risk and security to help the commercial side. So, when you look at the security functions, you know, you've got cybersecurity, you've got information security, and you know, what we talk about in this podcast is often cognitive security. Mm -hmm. And cybersecurity is, is about protecting the data. And then you have information security, it's about protecting data and other aspects of information that place an organization at risk. Now, if you're into Venn diagrams, cybersecurity is a subset of information security but it's growing in the percentage of information security because so much of an organization, what an organization does is via, is in, or via cyber or in the cyber context, you know, it's getting more attention. You know, as you talked about on this podcast and others, data is the new oil and he who owns the data, you know, uh, is the most influential and, and that this problem in, of protecting the data is so acute, you, you can't help but emphasize the importance of cybersecurity. But how, how much of cybersecurity uh, so includes or is part of information security really kind of depends on the size of the organization, its culture and its assets and ability or resources and its ability uh, to do something more than uh, just cybersecurity. So I, I'm, I'm trying to take, okay, how do we, how do I help as, as small businesses, perhaps mid-sized businesses improve their cyber security, but take a more holistic, you know, look at the risk and security. So you're, you're trying to, you know, advance the football, if you will, not just in cyber security, but along all lines of security. But when you, Look at cognitive security. Um, I, I don't think that, co that cognitive security encompasses all other securities. I almost, I envision it kind of sitting on a different plane, if you will, uh, or you know, maybe a, above and to the right of or something over information security and cybersecurity. And it's, it's pulling particular threads. So, you know, in terms of an organization, cognitive security is about protecting your organization's leadership, employees, customers, and shareholders' decision space mm. you know, with regard to that organization. So, you know, uh, and other guests on your show have said, you know, cognitive security is an approach to behavioral economics, is, is to get people to be behave in a way that's favorable to the organization. Well, you know, de depending on how that information or data gets out, it might affect, you know, any of those groups, leadership, employees, customers, and shareholders decision about what to do with your organization. So cognitive security, how, how do you protect the organization's decision space? I, I'm very, again, very much caution to say that everything is part of cognitive security, because then you run into the same dilemma that you had militarily with information operations, where IO is everything because everything sends a message and that's not the case. And I'm not looking to do that. You know, furthermore, I think if I walked into a boardroom and said, yeah, hi, I, I want to improve your cognitive security. You know, I, I think of the boss from the movie office space, you know, I might say, mm, yeah, yeah. Right. I, I, don't, I don't know if how, how well that might go over. <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, I'm still considering, you know, how to construct and offer an information security assessment that's more than just cybersecurity and pulls on those information threads that go through an organization to enhance cognitive security uh, through improved information security. Um, you know, I'm not certain what's going on, uh, if, it's, if this is something new, 
it's been done in the military uh, and in the army side. First IO command uh, does like the kind of holistic information vulnerability assessments. Uh, but you know, you have to look is, is, is this have an additive value to cybersecurity? If you can't make a clear value proposition towards connecting these dots, is it worth anybody's time and space to kick around, you know, that idea? Uh, you know, so if I'm going to kick around the idea, that's why I'm kicking it around here. And let's see what type of feedback you get from it. We had a great discussion a few months back with a couple of gentlemen from the Army Cyber Institute at West Point. So right, right there uh, with your alma mater. Uh, they discussed um, force protection or co cognitive force protection. It seems like uh, your thought process, your uh, vantage on this challenge could be similar, except in the commercial space, looking at this kind of a, a force protection in the cognitive domain. Would you say that that's fair? Oh, yeah, I think that's completely accurate. And, and thank you uh, for reminding me about that. I did listen to that uh, podcast. I, I thought the same, but it's, uh, it, it's something I need to go back and, and listen to and, and, and consider because uh, I think it'll be very helpful to, towards what I want to do. Right. When you, you mentioned uh, a few moments ago talking about how cognitive security is about protecting the organization's leadership, its employees, customers, and even uh, shareholders, it seems that the military's uh, force protection requirements could be uh, at least partially cross-decked over into the corporate world as well. So, yeah, wow. Yeah, you know, maybe we talk about that one uh, some more, but just, you know, from like a military perspective, you know, you look at, you know, internal and external audiences um, and maybe the, the, the comparable pieces to this or, or audiences would be, you have, you know, the military formation that you're in and its leadership and, and service members, you have family members, mm -hmm. you have uh, Congress and, you know, the great American public who are kind of the shareholders, if you will. And, you know, then you also have, you know, because a lot of times you're talking about uh, international support or host nation support, that, that audience in the host nation. And sometimes you can kind of look at that and say, is that your customers or your clients? Yeah. And uh, organizations now are, you know, w with their contractors, uh, you just mentioned family members, maybe extended family, but uh uh, investigating risk, not just directly with the, the person or the business with whom you're engaging, but with the people and the businesses that are affiliated with, with the business or the person with whom you're engaging to, to assess like a deeper level of risk, uh, which we're finding to be something that has been, I guess, you know, lacking, but it's starting to come online now, it, it, investigating the businesses that are uh, supplying the businesses that the government is, is doing business with. That's a, that's a bit of a mouthful, but. Yeah, no, I think that's a, it's a great point. Now, you know, for example, you have the cyber maturity model certification, CMMC, and that is, you know, how do, how do the primes and the subs and the subs to the subs uh, you know, protect, you know, the DOD information as it contributes to a solution. It's being expanded, of course, to all the federal government. And, and I'm having, you know, discussions with commercial companies that are, you know, looking and saying, you know, you can apply these same standards, take these same templates, uh, if you will, or, 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 or methodologies to the commercial sector and say, hey, you know, we, we can get you to a similar CMMC level 135 certification. And, it, and even if you don't do business with the Department of Defense, it does, or the federal government, it doesn't matter because it still gives you a standard uh, to seek and to, to, to achieve. And you sit there and say, hey, look, if, if I can, 
if I'm good enough to do business with the federal government, you know, have I done my due diligence to my shareholders, to my company? Mm. And, and maybe the answer is yes. Well, uh, speaking of standards, it uh, sounds like you are perhaps honing in on your own kind of a standard or a, a, a model. Is, is this something that you're thinking about for your business and for your corporate clients? I, I am. And, and if I'll be very frank, uh, you know, as, as the saying goes, uh, plagiarism is the most sincere form of flattery. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I've been taking notes from another podcast. Um, Rick Howard, who hosts uh, CSO Perspectives, and I'm mulling around, I'm kicking around uh, Rick's cybersecurity principles to see how I might use them and construct a, a broader information security model for you know, my business and, and its potential customers. So R Rick is retired military. He once led uh, the Army Computer Emergency Response Team, the ACERT, and he's a former leader at Palo Alto. And on his podcast, you know, he's established a first principle and some supporting tenets. And I've considered these and I've, I've started to, you know, mentally manipulate them into a parallel and possible more expansive construct. Now, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to refute anything that Rick's done. I think they're great. I'm trying to build upon it and, and say, okay, can we do something here that's, you know, more better? Um, and is it something that it, it's, that's fun to do? Uh, and it's just something that an, an organization needs. So, you know, Rick's first principle is that the chief security officer must help the leadership measure the risk of a cyber breach doing material damage to the organization, which is what the question I posed earlier. I just, in, I just made it a little more broad and said measure the risk of an information breach doing material damage to the organization. And, you know, I think it's a great place to start. So, you know, when what Rick has done is he expounds upon the first principle uh, and he, he breaks it down to four tenets, zero trust, resilience, risk forecasting, and intrusion kill chain prevention. But over top of this, he's also talked about the importance of something called SOAR or security orchestration and advanced research. And actually there's, there's a, another acronym, but that's the one that I've, I've seen and I kind of gravitate towards. And I think it's because to me, you know, the importance of SOAR is, is the importance of that word orchestration. It pops out at me because that was the word that was often used for information operations 20 years ago. It's about orchestrating these capabilities to achieve a temporal advantage. So likewise in cybersecurity, you know, you're, you're looking for an advantage uh, and it's very tough to have an advantage when you're on the defense because you have to be right, you know, every time. And, and that's just a kind of a colloquialism that anybody in the business knows and understands. So, but along those lines, so I'm thinking, you know, what other information orchestration needs to occur that can extend that cybersecurity aspect through to a greater information security and beyond to enhance the organization's cognitive security. Mm. So, you know, I'm going to kick around, you know, some of these. So, zero trust or zero trust architecture. Um, it, there, there's a technical and mechanical logic to it, and you know, from a, a cybersecurity, and it includes identity access management for the person or user and the machine. And, you know, there's these six pillars, or I'm sorry, there, there are six pillars uh, to it, depending on, on who you are. But this is, again, in a model, it's as good as anything. It's, it includes users, devices, network, applications, automation, and analytics. So, you know, to, to think of it like this is when you log on to your business system and, you know, it recognizes, you know, John Bicknell, Here's your login and ID and your password. And now you have multi-factor authentication. So you have that and that's like another uh, you know, level of security. So now John's into the system and, and what you're accustomed to is you can go in that system where you have been allowed to go. And, oh yeah, no, no kidding. Well, what's that mean? For example, um, 
you know, using the old Windows NT construct, um, you, you maybe had uh, users, power users, trusted agents, and administrators. Uh, I, I think it was something like that, right? But each one had, you know, you had user, power user, of course, had more latitude to go places in the network. And so if let's just say John was a power user or he had more, uh, you know, uh, ability to, to go throughout the network and access data and applications, wherever a power user could go, John can go. Well, what zero trust architecture is saying is at each level, it has to have a way of authenticating that this is John Bicknell. So when John goes into certain files, it's not just going to say, oh, he already logged in. He's good. There, there's some other check in there. And maybe John sees it or doesn't see it. And maybe John has to take an action or not to get into uh, that level of the data or that application. You know, could consider like what um, what happened with like a private Manning or Mr. Snowden. They, they just had you know, mm -hmm. Mr. Snowden had administrator access. He could access everything. Um, and there was no other check within the system as he's going through it to verify. So, you know, there might be another level of authentication where you have to take another action. So whereas you used to just freely move before and, and, and did what you want, you might have to take other steps and that might slow it down, right? But so when I so when you speak to me or, or when in, when National Security Agency who developed the zero trust architecture puts this out to the public and to the Department of Defense, I understand it. It makes sense to me and most anybody in cybersecurity. You know, this is what you need to do. And in another podcast, uh, Betsy Carmelite from Booz Allen. He describes the zero trust concept and hits upon that greater orchestration that I alluded to earlier. And, and I'm just going to read a couple of sentences from her, uh, uh, from her excerpt. Yeah, sure. The heart of this is clear communication strategies at all level for adopting zero trust. I mentioned all these levels because zero trust is looking at cybersecurity as a whole, not in silos or in cybersecurity functions individually. It requires a lot of coordination between infrastructure and engineering, security and all the implementation teams. And sometimes we have to orchestrate that participation to get the information flowing and be very intentional about prompting for information. Hmm. I, I, I really like what she says there. The organization has to orchestrate a communications effort within to make the security plan work. That's now an information thread that I'm looking for. And I, I think she does a great job of explaining it. And I, I, don't, I don't know if she meant this or not, but I would recommend the plan go beyond coordinating security amongst the infrastructure, engineering, security, and implement, implementation teams. The communication plan needs to touch every user because they need to understand what's going on and why they maybe have to take more action than they did before. And I, I don't like to get into the war of the words, but words matter. Um, you know, so National Security Agency calls this zero trust architecture. I'm fine with that. I understand that. However, if you're going to explain this to your users, think about the implementation, uh, implications of saying to your users, we're putting in a zero trust architecture because if not communicated properly, we don't trust you. You know, if you're a company commander, you wouldn't call your lieutenants and say, hi, everybody, welcome to the team. I'm your new boss and I zero trust you. You know, what would Simon Sinek say if you were to, you know, about leadership, if you were to call people in your office and, you know, or stand in front and say, hi, we zero trust you. Yeah. Well, that, that's not the goal. I've, I've sat in a forum and uh, one of the counterparts likes to stress, no, call it explicit trust. Now, I'm not certain of that person's, um, 
you know, Moses behind that, but I kind of like that term. Um, and, but this is what you need to, you need to consider is in that communication plan and in that orchestration of that plan is why are you doing this and, and what are you going to call it? Because it does make a difference on, on how people are going to react to it. You know, you know, once upon a time, you know, I once I was the supervisor of a, an SCI system, a, a, a top secret um, sensitive compartment, sensitive compartmented in, information uh, system. And I had another colonel came to me and said, hey, I, I, I need a, an account. I said, OK, you know, sounds fine. I went to the security manager. I said, hey, we need to get the colonel account. And the security manager paused for a second and said, why? You know, this, this person, you know, that office doesn't do any SCI work. And you're like, oh, yeah, you know, it's not just because, you know, uh, it, it's another kernel. And, I, you know, I'm like, yeah, you know, so you're right. I have to go back and you know, deliver the bad news. And, of course, you know, it's sometimes, you know, what happens to your peer, your, your, your looks back, so, you know, har harumph, I, I, I can't, <laughs> you can't do this to me. Yeah. I, I, you know, and but that, that's the this is, you know, again, zero trust architecture is, is something that you're striving for, but how you communicate it, uh, it matters. And, and so that's why I think there's a, a, a little bit more to it. And how do we pull that information thread? Right. This, you, and, you know, yeah, this, this, this very kind of thing, uh, I experienced it maybe from a slightly different perspective in a in a corporate in uh, a job that I had a few years back. Uh, this one fellow that I worked with. Uh, well, so the, the the organization was doing. It sounds like a, just about a, exactly what you're describing. There, they were trying to overlay uh, into the organization some appropriate. Uh, you know, more stringent security requirements into an organizational culture, which, you know, didn't have this type of mentality. And so just what you're describing, you know, uh, communicating effectively to the workforce uh, that these enhanced security measures are, are necessary. And on top of that, it's not that we don't value your expertise, whatever the employee's expertise is, or your, uh, your competencies or knowledge of information security, but we have to do this in order to uh, de-risk the entire ecosystem. And so this one fellow that I worked with, he had you know, root access to his uh, PC uh, at this organization, and they, you know, administratively took away that that access, and they didn't communicate very effectively, you know, why and et cetera, et cetera. So it, it resulted in a whole bunch of uh, uh, hurt feelings and confusion and uh, uh, friction, which no organization needs as you're trying to um, uh, compete and adapt to the changing. Uh, competitive landscape out there. So, you know, just exactly what you're talking about, it sounds like. Yeah, you know, I, I, as the saying goes, um, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yes. Uh, so you want to change your security strategy and your organization culture doesn't support it. Um, and, and now you have cultures are changing because of the reactions to the pandemic and you're going to have more mm -hmm. people working from home. Yeah. Uh, you know, communications is as important as ever. Right, right. Um, and um, it also speaks to the uh, holistic aspect of this challenge as well. The, the uh, CSO, the chief security officer, may have the lead for implementing these new programs and security measures, but it really is a whole organization activity from you know, human resources all the way through finance and security. I mean, everybody is involved in upgrading the organization appropriately. Would would you say that's fair? Yeah. yeah yes. And, and that's a great point. Um, I have a, you, you mentioned human resources and the like, and I'll, I'll throw a, a couple of, uh, 
uh, other you know observances from my colleagues. Um, my my friend and colleague uh, Eric Kuttner, he, he likes to remind me, that Carm, never forget, the inf- internet was designed by people for people. Mm. You know, it's it's just still John Davis. You know, when we talk about computer network attack back in the day, would remind us, hey, there on the other side of that computer, on the other side of that bot, on the other side of that algorithm, is a person who took action for a specific reason. Mm-hmm. So you, you you can't lose sight of that. Um, and a, a, another uh, colleague, uh, Mike Malor. And, you know, he stresses, you know, don't, don't get too hung up on the technology. You know, it, it's about people, processes, and technology. And others have said that too, people, processes, and technology. But processes are often where people and technology come together. Mm-hmm. So, you, you know, right. you, you, you can't leave that human aspect out of that. Um, you know, well, again, one of the other tenets is resilience. Um, so look at you know people's resilience, and, and what's interesting is I'm I'm starting to see uh, more indicators of you know of organizations acknowledging yeah again this is the people problem. I've had some very interesting uh, discussions and uh, analysis of training solutions that you know focus on people's habits, and, and it's actually kind of fun in that what it does is it evaluates. Uh, the people's, uh, you know, your employees' behavioral trends. And then based on their trends, it comes up with a tailored training for that person. Which, you know, if you came out of the Department of Defense, you know, and the information assurance training, you know, you've done it so many times, it's the same thing. At least now you have the accelerated, you know, uh, pre-test version. Hey, can I just test out? Um, and that has a, a, a purpose to it too, but it would was it gets people's buy-in um, by understanding, you know, what are your habits, and, and what are your weaknesses and your strengths. Um, it's just a great way to make people you know buy into the solution. Um, one of Rick's uh, other tenets is you know, risk forecasting. Um, you know, now is you know, I mentioned earlier about being able to speak to the operational, so what? And, you know, one of the challenges, uh, you know, that we have in the technology side is, again, we get kind of hung up on the technology or the solution, but it's being able to, you know, translate that in, into risk. And I, I'm, now I'm seeing solutions, a couple of them, where, you know, they're taking industry standards and they're saying, okay, if you're in this type of industry, uh, you're, th- this is your vertical. Uh, here are the most likely threats. And here are the industry standards that are, are being paid for for insurance, uh, which, which again is a risk mitigation strategy. And uh, these are the other solutions that are put in place. And this is how, you know, based on your threat and your vertical, uh, these are the um, solutions and practices and the like that will give you the best payoffs. And that, again, though, is about helping the leadership of the organization make a better decision. Like you said, you know, the, the chief security officer uh, is the one who's going to implement it, but the, the buy-in has to come at the top. And the understanding and the vision has to come from the top. Mm. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, the, the, the CSO is, you know, it will always be rowing against the current to some degree. Right. Yeah. No doubt on that. Uh, you, you mentioned just a moment ago or a couple of times uh, the um, concept of uh, standards. And it sounds like you and other uh, thought leaders in this space are you know, potentially you know, ho- honing in on what could eventually become uh, a, a new standard relative to cognitive security, but we had another uh, podcast discussion with a gentleman named uh, Greg Treverton, and he uh, also discussed uh, standards and how uh, technology standards are 
uh, it's something important for us, uh, the, the West in general, to, to continue leading the way on so that um, our uh, values uh, and um, uh, capabilities are, you know, baked into the world's uh, AI and, uh, you know, modern corporate standards rather than the, the way our adversaries tend to do business. Uh, do, do you have any thoughts on, on that concept? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and first of all, thank you for including me in the, uh, the, uh, the group of thought leaders um, in the area. <laughs> sure. I, and yeah. I, I don't know that I would uh, put myself in there. I'm just uh, you know, uh, trying to, to make it uh, better and, you know, by taking a different look on things. Um, you know, as I recall too, you had a, a guest, um, you know, who, who spoke about, you know, there's disruptive innovations and then there's, you know, iterative yes, uh, innovations. Right. right. That was a uh, sh uh, sh Ghosh. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Right, that was, right. that was a, a very, very intriguing discussion. Yeah. I, I'd say this is maybe more iterative. Um, now that, that that's, that's different if you're from a per perspective of whether or not you want to uh, you know, venture capital and invest in a uh, type of technology, but this is still a, a about trying to advance, the, you know, the idea of overall security. You know, we talk about the norms and behavioral norms and, and you know, you, you touched about some very important things. And let's look at like some couple of recent events. So you had the solar winds breach, which you know, there were some members of Congress were saying, oh, this is an act of war. And, you know, a lot of people in the business, so to speak, were saying, uh, no, it's not. It's just a good old fashioned, you know, intelligence work. Um, it, it's spying and, you know, you win. Um, we're, we're, doesn't mean we're just got to sit back on our thumbs. But, you know, this this isn't, a, you know, let's let's push the cyber button, you know, go to war type of scenario. Right. Um, th this is this is going to require. Th this is part of the long game uh, of an aspect of you know, political warfare, if you will. Okay, got it. Now look at the colonial pipeline situation. Now, no, no, hold on a second. All right, this is not spying. This is a type of blackmail extortion. Uh, or you even had the the organization who did it even put out a note. Oh, we're we're not trying to cause any damage. Um, and, you know, they attack the business side, not the operational technology side. So we're conforming. Um, yeah, th thanks. Thanks for the nice gesture, uh, but not so much. Um, you know, ransomware in particular is a real challenge. Um, I, I think that this is going to uh, spawn some other um, moves from the United States and other like-minded countries um, to take action against those countries that may be um, harboring or tolerating these ransomware gangs to operate. Um, but it requires, I think, a different type of response. Uh, it might be more you know, legal in nature um, because it's a, it's a crime versus espionage, um, which is a, a different type of, of activity. But I, I, when I look at the, or the situation with regards to ransomware and the like, um, the, the, the tolerance of it now is, is about hitting its limits. And I think there's going to be some very uh, concerted efforts uh, to do something about this in the international legal aspect uh, that's going to, it, it's, it's going to win or it's not, no, no kidding. Um, but I think in the next year or so, we're going to make a lot of um, progress towards eliminating it. Espionage, on the other hand, isn't ever going away. And there's some, there, some differences to it. Um, but this, this, this ransomware uh, it's not going to get, I don't, it's not going to get tolerated. Right. Well, it's good. There's going to be other fallouts from it. Yeah. Well, there is clearly um, uh, a whole lot of change and uh, needing to adapt, uh, you know, in the, this arms race uh, that is fueled by 
AI and the uh, cyber highways that uh, the AI rides upon. It's a, a heck of a problem. And I'm glad that you and others are uh, putting, some, putting some deep thought to it. There was just one other uh, aspect uh, from Rick Howard's model that I didn't mention. Sure. Um, and that was you know, the intrusion kill chain prevention. Um, and, and that is where you take a software solution and you analyze it against the MITRE attack framework for vulnerabilities. And you know, I think there's something to consider there as well. And just you know, real briefly, you know, RSA uh, was breached nearly a decade ago. And you know, when you look at it, it's like the, the threat knew that Lockheed Martin used an RSA one-time password key generator. And it also you know, picked a person to specifically target. Um, you know, was that information available through internet advertising where one company tells the, the world of its latest mega contract? Uh, is, you know, what's your value in advertising and putting out the type of information? So, some organizations are very discreet about that and, or, and what they use. Um, and, and then also, you know, if you have a nation state actor coming after you and they have a ground game with human intelligence, you know, they might be hanging out at those offsite lunch places looking for employees who forgot to remove or cover the badge change, uh, where they might also hang, you know, the RSA one time password, you know, device. So, you know, th these are again that these are those information aspects that's that's a greater uh, security uh, than just the hard cyber security. So I, I just wanted to, to make that plug. Uh, I'd like to conclude, if I may, Carm, by uh, asking you if you could share with our audience any uh, uh, books or other uh, resources that you think might be helpful to understand the problems better or, you know, just uh, things that are maybe on your, on your nightstand that, um, that, that people might appreciate? One, I, I recommend uh, trying some other podcasts. Uh, the CyberWire Daily, uh, I listen to that and to the Cognitive Crucible uh, every chance I get on my, on my morning uh, walks and jogs. Um, it, you know, CyberWire does discuss uh, information, disinformation, misinformation. So it's not just about all things cyber. Uh, the other one uh, I recommend is a, book by uh, Dr. Christopher Paul from the Rand Corporation called Information Operations Doctrine in Practice. Uh, this is very much, I think, should kind of be basic reading uh, for anybody in the Department of Defense who's involved in information operations and cyber operations, although I think, you know, uh, commercial can benefit from it as well. In it, though, Dr. Paul discusses the metaphor relationship or um, between information operations and cyberspace operations. And he says, it's not comparing apples to oranges. It's comparing apples to apple carts, where information are apples that ride along an information cart highway, which is cyber. Mm -hmm. does, does the information or does the apple cart owner know how to grow a good apple that people will want to buy and use? Not necessarily. Uh, does every apple bought and sold move over the apple cart highway? No. Some move by ground, some move in a paper bag, some move by catapult, some move by balloon. But more and more, they're moving by that apple cart highway. And that apple cart highway user is seeing where all the apples are being bought and sold. So there's a synergy there, there's a relationship there uh, that we can capitalize upon. So that, that's kind of a, 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 maybe almost a primer, if you will, or, or, or mid-level uh, if you, when you get beyond, you know, the, the John Arquilla's work. So uh, a couple other books uh, to consider. Um, one, if you're ever interested in coordinating a large information campaign, I recommend Bare Knuckles and Back Rooms by Ed Rollins. He was President Reagan's uh, campaign manager um, and kind of like set the standard for uh, how, how to win almost all of uh, the electoral college. 
Uh, there, there is some politics discussion in there, but even when you get past that, it, it's about you know coordinating the large information campaign. And uh, another one is Ledger Domain by James Heafy. Um, and this is about coordinating inf information efforts to a deception plan. Uh, very interesting book. Um, it, it is a fictional narrative. It's mostly nonfiction. I think what happens is that he did some embellishing perhaps on the, uh, the Amore uh, within the book to make it a little more intriguing. Um, but it's very interesting in the United States efforts to simultaneously counter French colonialism post-World War II while at the same time hiding nuclear weapons on a French installation in Morocco. Very interesting. Wow. All right. Well, thank you for those recommendations. And as always, we'll have links to those and other resources mentioned during the discussion in the show notes. And with that, Carm Chickalis, thank you so much for being on the Cognitive Crucible. Uh, it's been a pleasure, John. Thanks so much for the opportunity. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.